Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and today we're going to talk about dual band filters and how to actually process the images to make the colors pop a bit more, especially the contrast between the blue and the red. And yes, dual band filters have been super popular recently and there's tons of those filters out there. There's the Optolong L Enhanced, the Optolong L Extreme, the SCT Duo, the ZW Duo Band, uh, we have Cytron Japan Quad BP. Uh, IDAS also has some filters there, there. Everyone and their mother is having those filters right now and they work great with color cameras to get really high contrasty images of specific targets in space more specifically nebulae uh, and emission nebulae even like that most of those are in the Milky Way uh, there's the Orion Nebula as well and they emit light at specific colors or specific frequencies or wavelength and we try to capture only the, those wavelengths and this works great because we capture all of the light that we want from the object we want to target and we reject a lot of the light pollution and up to a couple of years ago this was only possible with monochrome cameras and single band filters that could be very expensive. Nowadays with color cameras and uh, those dual band filters we can achieve something similar. Now the dual band filters typically will uh, capture two band passes H alpha for hydrogen alpha which is in the red spectrum and oxygen 3 for um, which is in the green to blue spectrum mostly green though and uh, some filters will actually have a third band for sulfur 2 but sulfur 2 is also very much in the red so it gets kind of like mixed in with H alpha but sulfur 2 is very important because this is what is used typically to create the Hubble palette which is kind of a way of merging three band passes together oxygen 3, sulfur 2 and H alpha to create uh, really nice colors and um, there are ways actually with dual band filters to imitate this Hubble palette but it's I find those ways slightly difficult. Uh, my friend Sean from Visible Dark Astro actually has a really good tutorial about that. I'll put a link in the description down below and also a link to his video uh, right now uh, here if you're interested. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bit something a bit different. I'm going to use uh, the actual physical principles of those narrowband filters what I've observed as the sulfur 2 channel how it works and um, and how we can work with that to use four axis combination method for narrowband images which is a color combination method I find much easier than the Hubble palette that actually does not murder one of the colors that we have captured unlike the Hubble palette and uh, that is super easy to actually deal with and I've presented a video about that a while back so if you are interested feel free to go up above and check that video and I'll also be putting li the link down below to Forax's blog where he actually shows what formula we're going to use and I'm going to use that in this video. The subject for today is going to be the Crescent Nebula and I have it on my screen right now. Okay, and I am now in PixInsight where we can see the actual image that's fresh off the stack. Uh, the only thing that I did to this image is a very quick automatic background extraction. It's the only thing I did. And really what you're seeing here is very close to what the final image would be. You do have the nebulosity around the nebula. The nebula itself is uh, H alpha red. And we have a bit of the envelope around the nebula here, but you can see I don't have a lot of details here. And this is something that is very, important to note is when you're using a dual band filter like that you really want to make sure that you maximize your signal to noise ratio in the oxygen 3 and oxygen 3 corresponds to green and blue and actually it's more towards green than it is towards blue and H alpha corresponds to the red channel and H alpha is super strong in terms of signals typically while typically oxygen 3 is much weaker so very quickly you'll have really good signal to noise ratio in H alpha but the signal to noise ratio in oxygen 3 will actually be trailing behind and uh, so after a while you will not get more benefit 
for ex by exposing more for your H alpha for the red channel, but you will see more and more details in the green and blue channels which correspond to oxygen, oxygen three. So this is very important. Expose as long as you you can. You're not gonna actually like make the H alpha too strong by exposing longer. You, I mean, there's a limit to hard signal to noise ratio and it gets enhanced over integration time. So really, you're gonna be enhancing uh, the oxygen three and H alpha after a while will not change that much with further integration time, further exposure time of your targets. Now, if you look at this, this is indeed quite noisy and we're probably not going to get a great result, but let's try using that uh, combination method that I, uh, uh, that I mentioned. And the Hubble telescope to create those colors, um, it uses three filters. It uses H alpha and O3 that we get uh, here, so blue is O3 and red is H alpha, but also uses sulfur 2, which is also in the red spectrum and which we have not captured here, captured here. And even if you had a filter that included sulfur 2, which a lot of filters actually do include sulfur 2, it gets mixed up in the red. And because sulfur 2 is such a low weak signal compared to H alpha, it can kind of completely gets lost in H alpha and doesn't add anything to the image. There's no way to extract it separately. But I am going to uh, use an observation that I've done doing a lot of narrowband imaging from Tokyo using a monochrome camera and single bandpass filters uh, to really simulate kind of sulfur two. And so let's, uh, let's do that together. So instead of uh, treating this picture as a normal um, color picture and then processing it, which would me give me a final result that would be very similar to that with more pop, uh, with colors more popping out, that kind of stuff. Um, I will also not use the Hubble palette, but we are first going to decompose this image into its individual channels using this button here. And now you can see I have my red, green, and blue channels that have been extracted. As expected, the red is linked to H alpha, which has the strongest signal, so it has the most details and the least noise. If I look at the green, it has quite a few details, especially here in the areas of extended nebulosity, and it has more details than the blue. And the reason is simply because oxygen three is more towards green than it is towards blue. Although, and also uh, there are twice as many pixels of green in your camera sensor than there are blue pixels. So for each four pixels, you have one red pixel, one uh, blue pixel and two green pixels. So green will tend to have a, a higher signal to noise ratio uh, than blue, even if uh, oxygen three was exactly in the middle in between uh, green and blue. So we know that oxygen three corresponds to green and blue. Uh, and we can see, even if I zoom into green and blue, that, that external envelope uh, around the nebula is not really visible. This is simply because I have not accumulated enough exposure time, but it's been raining in Tokyo for ages and cloudy, so I have not been able uh, to add any more data. So, so we'll have to try to make do with what we have, which is actually really difficult. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is actually I'm gonna combine those two images here into a composite image, which will be my oxygen three because we know oxygen three gets to green and it gets to blue. So let's combine both. For that, I'll use pixel math. And you can see I have a pixel math formula that takes my blue, multiplies it by 0 0.3 and my green multiplies it to by 0 0.7. So those two factors there, they, their sum is equal to one. And I'm making sure that I'm actually giving more importance to green than I do to blue because I know that green has more signal uh, and signal to noise than blue has. But I still want to include the blue to some extent. So I've chosen 0 0.7, 0 0.3. You can adapt as necessary from your image. And I make sure that I, I check this create new image and this use single RGBK expression is still checked. I'm gonna click uh, on the square here and now we get a new picture, which is a blend of blue and green and we're gonna, gonna call it oxygen three. Now H alpha is very simple. Uh, we're just gonna take the red channel and say that the red channel is H alpha. So now we have H alpha oxygen three and what about sulfur two? Well, sulfur two is in my, all of my observations, sulfur two has been a very weak echo of H alpha for most of the targets that I've imaged. 
And so we want something that looks like H alpha, but it's not exactly like H alpha. It's weaker and more of an echo of H alpha. What do we have available to actually do that? Well, we know that H alpha provides the strongest signal among the image in general. And we have the image like this. So the image itself, if I convert it to black and white, it's mostly H alpha. It has a bit of oxygen three. It's kind of an echo of H alpha. So we could use that as uh, basically a, as this cell sulfur two, it makes no sense, uh, physically speaking, but it's probably going to give a result that's actually not so far off than if I had had an individual sulfur two filter, simply because we have um, an echo of H alpha. So we have H alpha is the strongest signal, sulfur two, our fake sulfur two here is an echo of H alpha. And then we have oxygen three, which is a proper blend of uh, the green and blue channel. So oxygen, oxygen three actually represents oxygen three, H alpha actually represents H alpha. Uh, sulfur two is like my imagination, but hey, um, you could probably based on that actually create a Hubble palette. And maybe you could try using Sean's method, could be interesting. But uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use four axis combination method. Before I apply this combination method, I want to stretch my images because it works best on nonlinear images. And to stretch the images, we want to make sure that after they're stretched, they have the same kind of um, level. They are roughly the same brightness for each of the images. Because unless that's the case, when we actually combine the images, one color might win over the others and we don't want that to happen. So to do that with the standard picks inside tools, the best way is to use the masked stretch process. This process where you can set a target background here, for example, 0 0.20 and then apply it to each of the images in turn. My preferred solution is actually to use uh, the easy processing suite crit script the soft stretch script. Now easy, the easy processing suite is something that has built by a person called Dark Arkan. It's an awesome uh, suite of tools for PixInsight. It's free, it's open source. I love it, it's awesome. If you haven't gotten it, get it. I'm leaving a link above to description about, um, to video about this uh, suite of scripts. So we're gonna use easy soft stretch. I'm just going to la launch it on each channel in, in turn we've applied it to H alpha, I'll do the rest. And here we are, we have done the, the uh, we are no longer linear and I can do the combination. Now the combination according to the blog uh, from Forax is this, this works on most targets. So let's try it as is. So I actually have a PixInsight process uh, ready for that. Here it is, it's exactly the same formula. I unchecked the use single RGBK expression because I want to be able to set for a formula for each of the colors. I make sure that I have create new image and I make sure that the color space for the new image is RGB color. And once I'm done, I'm gonna click here to actually create that image. We may want to also combine a luminance to that. So I might actually use just uh, the LRGB um, combination uh, tool here. We'll have S2 because it's the actual luminance of the original image and I'm just going to apply that. And now is the time to actually start playing with curves. Uh, now that I have the curves transformation tool open, the first thing I'm going to do is just open the preview using this and I'm going to, oops, use the RGBK curve here to pump up a bit the uh, exposure so we can see the image a bit better. I also want to pump up the saturation so we can see things again a bit better. And immediately you can see that compared to my original image, uh, which, is, which is here, we're getting some yellow within the Crescent Nebula. So we're actually getting something that looks more like a three color image rather than a two color image. And uh, so that's like, I'm doing this so we can see what we're doing. Now the next step that I'm gonna do is, you can see a lot of the background nebulosity is red. Now how can I make the contrast between that blue shell, uh, that blue envelope around the Crescent Nebula and the background red? Well, simply enough, I could simply go to the red channel here and pump it up a little bit, not too much, but like that. And you can see how it makes the whole nebulosity of the image pop. And at the same time, somehow, 
it makes that blue shell a bit more visible ag against the background of red color. So this is a little trick that I find works pretty well, is to get more visible nebulosity uh, across the whole image, is to actually like do what is counterintuitive, which is to actually enhance the increase the red color. This is not the only thing I'm gonna do. I'm also going to go inside the hue transformation here. And the hue transformation lets you enhance a bit that yellow color here. And you can see we have red yellow here at the bottom left end. This is what I'm gonna change. Before that, I'm gonna set four anchor points or three anchor points to make sure we don't affect the curve where we don't want to affect it. And I'm just gonna play around here and you can see it can make the nebula much more yellow and much more separate from the rest of the image. Even the little uh, edges here become a bit yellower, which really gives a more um, tricolor um, aspect to this image than we had uh, previously. So now we, and it makes really the nebula pop out so much more against the background than it did uh, before in the original image that we had. So with that, I can uh, maybe still apply a bit more uh, of a boost to the image, you know, something like this. And maybe we can, uh, we can say that this works well for now. So let's apply this. And that's the beauty of this combination method is the curves adjustment, including the hue after that works really well. And actually I'm really surprised to see the shell here is so well visible overall. Now I can do some further transformations on the curve. I can uh, increase the contrast a bit. I can make the red pop out even a bit, uh, a bit more so we have uh, more contrast between the nebula and uh, I mean the crescent planetary nebula itself and the general emission nebula from the Milky Way uh, behind it. And we could still play with the curves, uh, the hue, some more as you know as per as per taste to really get here a, a very punchy ima image and now we also want to stress a bit the blue envelope here when you zoom in the blue envelope is obvious but it is not super visible and there's not much that i can do because really we have um we don't have enough signal to noise ratio in the oxygen three side of things. So I will want to go inside the color uh, saturation. And what I could do is I'm gonna set some anchor points around and maybe around here, we're gonna increase the, uh, the saturation. And yes, it does make that, that blue color slightly more visible, right? It's not perfect, but it is slightly more visible, which is what we want to accomplish. And this is really a hack for me to get this more, uh, uh, more visible. It would be much better if we simply had more signal to noise ratio. And then as a final touch in terms of colors, we can use SCNR to remove a bit of the green from here. And here we are. And we could say that, like very reasonably that this is kind of our final image. I could do like a few more curves. I could do histogram equalization. I could do a lot of things, but overall, I think this is not a bad result from the data that we started with. Uh, this is what we started with. Um, this is what we end up with. We have a much bigger contrast between the nebula itself and the actual uh, uh, nebulosity in the background. Maybe I'll still do one touch on this image, which would be a quick star reduction using again the easy processing suite. Um, you can compare, by the way, the image that I have from my previous processing uh, to the current processing. You know, it's like all in all, it's all a matter of taste, but the previous processing is really bicolor. This looks a bit more like it has more colors, and I think on different subjects. Uh, like the Pelican Nebula, um, we'd have a bit more uh, difference as well. So I'm just gonna apply that star reduction. And here we are, and the nebula is even popping out some more, thanks to like the stars being less like in your face kind of thing, while still being present. The shell is there. We, we, I think it's not a bad image. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty decent for the data that we, uh, we started with. And I did not do any noise reduction, anything like that. 
So I think uh, we ended up with something that is indeed fairly uh, decent. I'll apply maybe a bit of noise reduction. I'll put that at the end of the video so we can have like a nice uh, montage with that, uh, that final image. Uh, but basically this is my method. And I hope this has been useful because and there's so many ways you can play with those images and dual band filters, they're really hard to deal with. And I'm still having trouble dealing with, I like this method that I have here and I'm, I can't wait to try it out on more nebulae, maybe even on the Orion Nebula, right? Uh, see what I can get out of it, it would be so much fun, uh, but the weather has not been cooperating. Um, okay, and that's pretty much it for this video. But you know, if you are new to this channel, if you're not a subscriber, first welcome to the channel. And you know, if you like this kind of video about processing or about astrophotography in general, I have tons of videos on multiple topics to help you get to the next level for astrophotography. Feel free to go down below, click that subscribe button, uh, click the little notification bell next to it. Really like tons of new videos are coming up among a range of subjects. And anyway, you know, feel free to also go down below, leave a comment, let me know if you have suggestions, tips and tricks, uh, feedback, all that kind of stuff. It's always very much appreciated. And also feel free to leave a like on this video. It helps a lot as well. Uh, so thank you so much for watching and remember whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.